Okay. Now, uh, so let's see. So that's content and that's bulletin. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me share my screen and I'll start with the uh, syllabus. Okay. So, so, uh, so here we are on the on the ninth, and uh, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about timer zero because we're going to use that tomorrow in the lab. By the way, I, I was really pleased. An awful lot of students came to lab this last Friday and uh, got their work done, so that was good. Uh, is if there's anybody is, is there anybody who doesn't have their board put together yet or hasn't picked up their board? I know there's a I know there's a few left over, so I'm. But if you haven't, be sure and do that and get it soldered together so you can get caught up. Um, all right, so so we're going to do lab two, and it's going to be we're it's going to be the same blink routine, but we're going to add some things. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do the delay instead of a counting loop like we did in the in the delay routine. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna use the timer zero module in the microprocessor, and we're gonna let the timer zero count for us now. The way we're going to implement it, it's not going to really help us that much because we're just going to sit there and wait till the timer times out. So we just as well could be counting, but um, but the, but but when we use it with the interrupt uh, in lab three, we'll let the timer count and we'll we can go do other things, and uh, and you'll see that uh, then when the timer times out, it'll interrupt us and uh, toggle the toggle the LED, and then we'll. Go back to doing whatever we're doing. Now, what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to use two LEDs, and we're going to do the counting loop for one and the uh, the interrupt routine for the other. So it's kind of, you know, it's not like we're doing anything all that all that great. But you'll see that with the interrupt, you can actually be doing other things, and then when the timer times out, uh, automatically it'll uh, it'll update it. And the timer is very uh, is a lot more precise than a timing loop usually because the the timers um, you know, they're, uh, it's, it's running on its own in a module and it's just a little more, you know, it tends to, tends to cause that interrupt on a very precise recurring basis. Uh, whereas sometimes your counting loop, uh, could get, you know, I don't know, uh, I guess it can be pretty precise too, if that's all you're doing, but anyway, okay. So, um, so that's what we'll do. So we're going to talk about that. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit more about, uh, some specific programming things, because um, we want to, uh, the programming test is coming up on the 28th. So we want to get you all queued up for that. And uh, the, not, don't worry about the programming test. The lowest grade you can get on it's a 70. And then you can just go up from there. So don't blow it off either. But I want you to, uh, I want you to be able to uh, um, absolutely understand uh, how to do several different things. And I think if you just, if we just, uh, we'll cover them in class and then next week we'll cover them, you know, in person in class, I think it'll be even more clear and hopefully um, you'll be more than ready for that. So we'll talk about that. Okay, uh, so that's that. Let me get rid of that. And then, um, so let's, let's talk about it. Uh, the, we'll talk about, let's see uh, here. Okay, so so uh, so we're going to use timer zero now. Uh, and I'll move this over here. There, in the in this in this mid level tip line, there are some things that 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 are basically legacy functions. And timer zero, almost all the microprocessors that PIC ever made had at least one timer in them, and so. So timer zero is not implemented the way, say, timer two, four, and six are implemented uh, because it's kind of a legacy timer. So it has some of its control registers in funny places. Uh, but other than that, it's, you know, very similar to the other timers. Uh, it just has a few couple of special features. And one of those special features we'll use when we do the touch sensing module. All right. So timer zero is an 8-bit timer. Uh, which means it, it only counts up to 256. But it also has an 8-bit prescaler. And um, with the 8-bit prescaler, it can count, that allows it to count 
256 times before it registers one count, one real count. And then it counts 256 times and then registers the second real count. So it effectively, uh, it effectively counts uh, the same, it counts 64K, just like our counting loop did. Uh, but you'll see that the, this, that the counter itself, because it, it only takes exactly one, um, uh, one uh, clock cycle uh, to, do, to do the counting, uh, it counts a little bit faster than our counting loop because our counting loop had several instructions in it. And so it takes a few clock cycles. So it's, a, it's a, just a little bit longer, um, not too much longer, but just a hair longer. I think it, like it has it maybe twice as long. Well, I don't know. Anyway, so you'll see that your light will blink a little faster with the uh, timer zero. Now, obviously we could change that. We could change our system clock. We could, we could, call, uh, we could call the timer two times before we return uh, and we can do lots of different things. Um, when, so we'll, we'll look at how this timer is put together, but it has a, so it has an eight bit counter with an eight bit prescaler. And uh, many timers do have prescalers in microprocessors. Uh, so not all of them, some of them just have a lot of like, the, like a 32 bit counter probably doesn't need a prescaler. Uh, you can, the clock source for your time, timer zero counter can actually come from your 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 internal clock, which we're running the you know uh, running our microprocessor on. Now let me just say a couple of things that, that let me um, let me add this. So we talk about we talk about our, our our internal clock, and we call it we call it FOS, and we set FOS at four megahertz by writing uh, six alpha zero x six alpha into OSCON. And that's how we set up the four megahertz clock. But each instruction is executed at what's called F OS divided by four. And so F OS divided by four is one megahertz. Now, when you use the system clock, most of the time, this is the clock you get you get FOS divided by four. So we actually get the one megahertz clock. Sometimes you get FOS directly, but most of the time when you use the system clock, it's FOS divided by four. And, and that's because each instruction executes in FOS divided by four, except for branch instructions. And that would be call, and that would be BRA, and go to. These, these take two clocks, two FOS divided by four times two, takes two of S. So, so these, take, these take two microseconds when we're running at four megahertz for FOS and one megahertz for FOS divided by four. So it takes two microseconds, but all the other instructions take one microsecond. So we're executing most of the time a million instructions per second. And so that's that, that so that's, uh, so that keeps us moving along pretty quickly. And our counter is gonna count, well, the prescaler will tick at, at a million times a second, which means every every uh, 256 microseconds will record one tick of our actual eight bit count. So it's basically 256 uh, microseconds times 256, and that that's going to be 64k microseconds. That's going to be uh, our our delay, the way it's set up here. Now you could. You can set it up differently, but that's how we that's how we're setting it up. You can also drive your timer zero with an external with one of your pins, and you can connect an external uh, square wave, and even choose which edge you want to count as the clock, so that you can count external pulses. And this actually can be very useful if you're trying to count an external event. Let's say you have a uh, let's say you have a little photo cell, and every time somebody walks past it. It triggers the photo cell. 
So you could set your timer up to count those events. And uh, now with an 8-bit counter, you can only count up to 256. Now you can use the prescaler, but then you you don't know where, what you don't know how many you don't know where the prescaler is. So your so so your count is always plus or minus 256, right? Uh, but you can do that. Of course, you can you could use timer one as a 16-bit counter. You could use that. That would let you count more. Um, and you can also use timer zero to trigger timer one, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we're going to look at this module in just a second in the data sheet, uh, which I didn't bring up yet. I'll do that. And what we'll see is that, uh, well, maybe let's see, let's see if I put it in here. Mm, no, okay. Let me let me go let me go do the data sheet. So I'm going to shrink this down. And I wanted to pull up the data sheet. I knew I'd forgotten one little thing. Oops. And where's my data sheet? There we go. Okay. So if we go down to timer zero, and you should read, you should read this uh, this little section in the, uh, okay, I know it's here. There, chapter 20, timer zero. Okay, so, so timer zero, <clears throat> you can see here, it's an eight bit timer counter with the following features. Uh, it has an eight bit register, which is where the counts kept called TMR0. It has an 8-bit prescaler. It has, um, you can pick the internal clock or the, or you can use an external pin and you can program the external edge. So you can choose rising or falling edge for the external edge. It will interrupt when it overflows. And you can also uh, pull on the overflow bit and, and software and just wait till it overflows without using interrupts. And then it can also use timer one. All right, so, uh, so here's what it looks like, the block diagram. So here's the timer zero counter module. And uh, you can load a value in here and then count from there till it overflows. Uh, or you can, uh, you can use the system clock divided by four, FOS divided by four, and you choose that with this, with this, uh, you choose that with this multiplexer here. Uh, and then you can run that straight into the timer, or you can run it through an 8-bit prescaler, which means if you set this 8-bit prescaler up correctly. All right, so there's the there's the module, and we'll do that. I'll, I'll get that going. So the 8-bit prescaler uh, then can count. Uh, it can be set for uh, ticking timer zero every 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 one uh, tick of os, f os divided by four every two uh, four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four all the way up to two fifty six. So we're going to pick two fifty six to give us the maximum count. And and then you can also do this with your external pin. And there's a couple of other things. This is the capacitive such tense mo uh, capacitive touch. Uh, the capacitive uh, touch sensing module, uh, which uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna use when we do that. We'll use both timer zero and timer one with that module to do our touch sensing, which works pretty well. Uh, it's not uh, there are some weaknesses to it, and that's why microchip doesn't use that touch sensing module anymore. But uh, but it works fine for our purposes. Uh, and then once this timer, this a bit counter, gets to to, to one, 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 and then it takes one more time, then it overflows to zero, 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 and it sets the flag on the timer one zero flag. Now you have to clear that flag, otherwise it'll just stay set. Um, and, but if you're checking that flag in a software loop, when that flag gets set, that's when we're going to return back. So we'll look, so let's look at, We'll look at the code. Um, and 
we have a three bit uh, register down here, a three, three bit controls for this multiplexer. And that selects which one of these, uh, which one of these eight bit feeds uh, triggers the, the counter. And we're gonna use the one, we're gonna use the, uh, uh, we're gonna use the highest order bit. Uh, so I'll show you. And to do that, we have to set it up. Now, how do we control this timer? We control this timer using this option register. Now, normally we would be controlling it with the timer zero control register, but because this is a legacy counter uh, and they were trying to keep the number of, uh, of core registers small, they combined it with some other functions. So in this register, there are some other functions. Uh, so uh, only a few of these things actually refer to the timer uh, zero. This is the weak pull up enable bit. And then um, the rest of these things uh, and this PSA, uh, yeah, that's prescalar assignment. So, so all the rest of the bits do refer to timer zero, but the, uh, the weak pull up enable bit uh, has to do with the ports and has nothing to do with timer zero. So then we have the interrupt uh, edge select bit. Oh, okay. So this has to do with the interrupt pin. So that doesn't affect timer zero. So these first two bits, unrelated to timer zero. But the rest of the bits are timer zero bits. Okay, so we'll talk about these other things later. This uh, TMR zero uh, clock source bit, if you put a one in here, then it, it, uh, it, trans, it, it transitions on the external pin. And what pin is that? Well, we have to look at the, we have to go look at the, at the, the list of, various pin functions here. Uh, let's see, device overview. I think this is where we look. Uh, no. no, let's see. Uh, okay. Maybe I'm still looking in the wrong place and I think I am. Okay, yeah, table of contents. I think that's where I have to look. Yeah, here it is. So, so this is this is our uh, this is the list of all the functions, and our chip is the uh, the SOIC. So it's in this column right here. So these are the actual pin numbers, which don't really matter, but these are the the names, and that's really that's how the the headers are listed anyway. So it's okay. And if we're looking now for the uh, uh, the uh, external pin for timer zero. And let's see, uh, it should say here, interrupt timers. Uh, yeah, so timer zero uh, clock in. Um, so this is the pin, so it's RA2. So, so uh, pin two and port A would be the timer zero input pin if we set that up. Um, now we're, we're using that for uh, our LED. Uh, so, but we could, but it, the only thing that would happen if we did select that is if we drove that from some other clock, the LED would flash every time, uh, you know, every time we had a pulse go in here, which would be kind of interesting. All right, so let's go back to timer zero, chapter 20. Okay, so if we go down to this module again, it, so, so this, this sets up, this bit sets up our clock source. It's either coming in on RA2 or we're using, if we put a zero in there, we're using FOS divided by four, which the way we've set it up will be uh, the one megahertz clock, internal clock. Then we have the uh, timer zero source edge select. Now this only applies if you're using the external pin so we're not using the external pin, so we don't get to pick the edge of the system clock we're using. And then the PSA bit here is the prescaler assignment bit. Prescaler is not assigned to the timer zero module, or if we put a zero there, prescaler is assigned to the timer zero module. Um, okay. And then the last uh, three bits here, we get to pick how much the prescaler is gonna count up. And here's what we get to select. If we put in one, 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 
we get one to 256. So that means 256 ticks in the prescaler finally gives one tick to the counter register, the timer zero counter register. And then there are a few other registers related to this timer module, and you always see this. So uh, if we're using the capacity sense module, uh, we've got a bit here that has to do with a timer zero. If we're using the fixed voltage reference, uh, that uh, I'm not sure how that affects it, but apparently it might. Uh, and then uh, if we're using the RA2 pin, then, uh, then we have our, our, our level control for that pin. Um, if, we're using, uh, if we're using the interrupt, uh, there's bits in the interrupt control register that relate to timer zero. One of those bits is the timer zero interrupt enable bit, which we'll use in our next laboratory, but not this one. And the other one is our timer zero interrupt flag, which we'll use uh, in this lab and in our next lab. Now, the way this works, the, whenever the timer overflows, it sets this flag every time. Now, you have to clear it in software. But if this timer interrupt zero enable bit is not set, there will be no interrupt generated. Now, besides this timer zero interrupt enable bit being set, you also have to set the global interrupt enable bit. So you have to have the global interrupt enable bit set and the timer zero interrupt enable bit set. And then every time timer zero overflows, it will cause an interrupt and also set the flag. We, that's what we'll set up next week. But this week, we're not gonna, we're not gonna enable the global interrupt enable bit and we're not gonna enable the timer, timer zero interrupt enable bit. So, so this flag will be set automatically but it will not cause an interrupt. But we can look at this flag by doing a bit check on this, on this register, which is the interrupt control register. So we're gonna, we're gonna do bit test F and we're going to stay in a loop as long as the bit is cleared. But if the bit is set, we'll skip out of that loop and we'll do whatever we're gonna do. So you'll see how, that, how we use that in just a minute. Okay. Uh, and then we also have the option register where we said, we just looked at that, where we set up the, the clock source. And if we use the external pin, we'd set up the edge. We, we go ahead and assign the prescaler and then we pick uh, our prescaler to one to 256. And then we have our timer zero register where the count's kept, which we could load a value in here if we wanted to, but we're not gonna bother with that. Once it rolls over, it'll just start counting again. And then uh, we'll clear the flag and we'll wait on it again. Uh, and we'll clear this, we'll clear this every time we, we start. And then again, here is the, uh, the TRIS register uh, for pin two to make it an input if we're gonna use it as our clock source for timer zero, which we're not, but we could use it to count uh, pulses on this pin if we wanted to set that up. All right, so, so timers have lots of uses. Uh, and then there's, it also has this, this gate function with timer one, but we're not gonna look at timer one yet. We'll look at that when we get to that module. Okay, now, uh, let me, so now let me look at the lab. Let's see, I think it's here. So if you go into, if you go into our, uh, into the course and you go down to lab and you click on pick lab, Uh, and you and you go down to lab uh, uh, two, then you can look at this uh, this uh, this lab two uh, blink LED timer zero PDF, and that's what we're going to look at here. So here it is. So you what you need is you need your your Viva board, your Snap programmer, and uh, a power source, hopefully a nine volt battery or your USB cord with a two point one millimeter plug. Again, if you want to find an old two point, uh, an old USB plug, and uh, so you can power it off of your laptop, or or a plug-in uh, USB plug, uh, I'll give you another plug if you want, and you can make one of those yourself. Um, okay, so 
the purpose of this lab is to understand how to use uh, this built-in module. And, um, and so you should read through all this. You should read through timer zero and you should look, this is the same register that we just looked at. And here's where we set the prescaler. We just looked at that too. The clock source, it explains all those things. So you should read through that. There's the block diagram again. And then we're also gonna use the RB7 push button. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, okay, so, so now I wanna look at the code. Well, let me, let's look at the push button real quick and then we'll look at the code. So this unfortunately is not the best uh, picture, but uh, it's a little fuzzy. So here's our push button right here. And it, it's actually a double, it's a single throw, uh, it's a double pole single throw switch. So you have, so if one of these breaks, it'll still work because the other one will be okay. Uh, and it's, it normally is not, is, is open. When you push the button, it's closed. So when you leave the button open, there's no connection here. Now notice what it does. There's a little jumper here. And if you have it jumped uh, one way, it connects the master clear pin to this. And if you have it jumped the other way, it, it connects it connects uh, this uh, uh, it connects uh, RB7. Uh, so we're gonna uh, in the old days we had it actually using a different pin, but now uh, it works better with RB7. So you have to look at your little board and let me let me I'll show you that. If we look at if we look at the board, you see the jumper there. You see it says master clear on one end, and it says uh, and it says RB7 on the other. So the jumper right now you can see is set for master clear. And to set it for RB7, I just have to pull it off, switch it over and have it on the other two pins. Remember the jumper always has to cover two pins to be working because the center pin is actually connected to the button. Now we modified it a little bit from this diagram uh, so that it would actually uh, work a little better. And uh, we have it set up so that, um, we have it set up so that uh, when the buttons, when the jumper's over here, uh, a, a pull up the pull up resistor on this pin is actually on the resistor and, and the pull up resistor is on this pin over here as opposed to in on the middle. But in any event, um, so when it jumpers over here, our pull up resistor is actually 100K. And that way, when you use RB7, there's always a 100K ohm resistor on it, but it actually works great. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, when so if you look at this, if it's jumpered over here, to what's called MISO here, but it's RB7. Uh, when you short this, it pulls, it pulls uh, this pin here, which is connected to RB7 to ground. When the button's released, it's pulled up to, v, to, to VDD, which is either 3.3 volts or five volts. So it's gonna read a one when the button is not pushed. That may be a little backwards to what you might've expected. And when you push it, the button will read a zero. So when it's pushed, it reads a zero. When it's not pushed, it reads a one. Pressed, not pr pressed, zero, not pressed, logic one. And, it, and it, the actual voltage will depend on what you're running the chip at, but, it, but it, it doesn't really matter. Either way, it's gonna read a one. And either way here, it's gonna read a zero. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now let's look at the, now let's look at the actual software. All right, so um, so I'm going to go back to here and look at the code. So here's here's what the delay here's what the delay routine now changes into. So there's a little bit of setup that we have to do, um, and I don't think I put this. I guess I didn't put the setup in here. See that's uh, right. So here's here's the here's the delay routine using timer zero. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing we do is we go to the interrupt control register, and we clear pin two. Now what is what is pin two? Pin two is the interrupt zero uh, flag, 
And you, let's see, you should be able to memorize, remember that from this uh, up here. Uh, the option, right? Uh, no, it's the, uh, it's the, um, it's the uh, uh, income register here, page 87. So we have pin two, pin zero is this, pin one is this, and pin two is this. And if you look down here, bit two, TMRF IF, TMRF, TMR zero IF, timer zero, overflow interrupt flag bit. If it's a one, timer zero register is overflowed. If it's timer zero, the register did not overflow. And but once it's once it's set, uh, you have to go in and clear it uh, in software. Now this is the enable bit for the interrupt, which we're not going to set on this lab, but we will next week. And so as long as this bit is left at zero, it disables the timer zero interrupt. So the flag goes off, but there's no interrupt because this bit's not set. And also. Uh, even if this bit is set, there'd still be no interrupt unless the global interrupt enable bit is set. All right, so that's that's that. So now, uh, so first thing we're going to do is clear that bit. And uh, but before we get to here, we're going to have to set up in our main code uh, the option register so that the timer zero is all set to go. Now, you remember, we did just look at that, right? We just looked at what we had to set up there and the option register, uh, which is right here. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I went to, went to the wrong place. Uh, yeah. It's just right now. So here's the register we have to set up. And so let's see, what do we want to, let's, how do we configure the option register for timer zero? So remember the first two bits are for other stuff we don't, we don't have to worry about them. Uh, but uh, if we just write the whole register, then we have to make sure we get the right stuff here. So we pull up enable. All we put, our, all we pull ups are disabled uh, and interrupt uh, edge select. Uh, since we're not using the interrupt pin, we don't care about this right now. So we'll just put, we'll put a, a, a one here and a, uh, and a zero here. Then the timer zero, uh, clock source select, we want uh, a zero here because we're using the FOS divided by four. We're using the internal clock. And then the edge select doesn't matter since we're not using the external pin. So we'll just put a zero here. So now we have one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so that's an eight in hex. And then our, our, uh, our prescaler assignment, this all, the prescaler can also be assigned to the watchdog timer. So that's a little, bit of an issue. We'll, we'll look at that when we do the sleep lab. All right. So anyway, the PSA uh, prescaler is not assigned to the timer zero module. Prescaler is assigned. So we want a zero there. And then we want these three bits here to be one, one, one. So we get a one to 256. So the final value is going to be one, zero, 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 right? PSA, right? Z is assigned. Yes, zero, one, one, one. So that's eight, seven, hex, zero, x, eight, seven. So we want to write a, a hex 87 into the option register. And that's what we'll do. And I think we show that uh, in this code here. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, we want to set this up. We're going to bank select the option register. We're going to move uh, literal to W0x87, and we're going to move W to F option register. So we're going to, that's going to set up the timer zero. But each time we actually do our delay routine, the first thing we're going to do is clear the flag. And then we're also going to bank sell the actual register, and we're going to put a one in it. And um, you could also put a zero in it, but I put a one in it uh, uh, because I was, I don't know, I wondered if if I put a zero, maybe it would reset the, the flag, but yeah, I'm sure it wouldn't. But we could also move this, this instruction here could be moved after we do this. That would also be possible. All right, so once we do all this, 
we now have timer registers starting from zero. So really, we're just going to count 255 times, not 256 times. And, uh, and so we go down here to T loop and we do bit test F skip, skip clear and the incon register. Now, notice we already bank celled it up here before the loop. So as long as we stay in this loop, we don't have to bank sell it again. And we're bit test it. And uh, we're going to bit test bit two. That's the that's the that's the uh, the overflow flag for uh, timer zero. And it we call that the timer zero interrupt uh, flag register, okay, or flag bit. So we're, so we're going to test it. Remember, it's cleared until it's cleared until the the, the timer overflows. When the timer overflows, that bit will be set. So if it's clear, we're going to skip the next instruction and do go to loop. We go up here to T loop and we do it again. And we just stay in this tight little loop here until the bit is finally set. When it's set, we don't skip and we hit this return and we return from our little delay subroutine. So now we're just going to substitute, the, the, we're just going to, in, instead of doing a call to our original subroutine, which you can leave in your program, by the way, because you'll need it for the, the next lab. So instead of instead of return instead of returning or instead of calling the regular delay routine, we're going to call delay two instead. And when you return, you just go back in your code like you did with your other delay routine. All right. Now let's see. Uh, so so that's that's how we're going to change. Now the other thing we're going to do differently is we're going to use the. Uh, we're going to use the the the, uh, the push button, and uh, here's here's how we can do the push button. We can do uh, we can test we can bank cell port B, and then we can do bit test F skip set port B comma seven. If it's set, then we'll just drop through. But if it's punched, if the button is pushed, then we it won't be set. We won't skip. And you'll hit, and you can do this branch to wherever you're going to jump. And this is this is going to this. You have to figure out how to use this to uh, either leave your leave your cause your 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 uh, blinking LED to either stop blinking and be in the off state, or stop blinking and be in the on state, or depending on when you punch the button to be in one state or the other. And you might have to put in this little snippet of code two times. Remember, once you change this bank cell, whatever comes after this, you have to bank cell that location in order to in order to use any other special function register or random access location. All right, so let's see. I think, uh, yeah. Now this process here, uh, where we where we're gonna where we did this let's see i want uh not that um not that let's see what i want is this yeah so 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 in this loop down here where we bit test f skip clear int con and then we uh stay in this loop until this bit is set. That is called polling. We're polling on the timer zero interrupt flag, which happens to be bit two of the incon register. So whenever we talk about we're going to poll on a bit, this is what we're talking about. And the only problem with polling on a bit is that that's all we're doing. We're totally tying up our, our processor doing this. Now that's fine. That's all we're interested in doing. But if we had, if we would like to be doing other things, then uh, then this this ties us up. Now the nice, the good news is uh, in the lab next week, you'll see that while we're doing this polling, uh, uh, well, we won't be polling on it. What we'll be doing in, in the other loop will be uh, we'll be just continuing the original lab one. But this will be going on in the background, not this polling, but 
but the, uh, the interrupt flag will get set when timer zero overflows and it'll cause an interrupt. And then we'll be in our interrupt routine and that's where we'll bl blink the other LED. So we'll have two LEDs being blinked at two totally different rates, one using a counting loop and the other using timer zero using an interrupt. Uh, but when we pull on a bit, we're pretty much, that's all we're doing. And that's true in the counting loop too. We're just counting in the counting loop. All right. So, um, yeah, I think, and I think I'm gonna, okay, I think I'm done with that. Um, yeah, and here's where we, we set up. So now we have two things we have to set up. We have to set up our oscillator control register with six alpha. So we bank cell, we move literal to W, six alpha, and we move that into OSCON. Takes three steps to do this. And then we have to bank cell the option register, move literal to W, hex 87, and move that into the option register. And that sets the prescaler up and all the various things, all the, all the things, the internal clock. And it also does uh, turn off the pull-ups, which are normally on, actually. They're on by default, it turns out, uh, I think, anyway. Okay. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So let me, let me stop with that, and then we'll come back in a second. But let me take a minute and see if anybody has any questions about, about that. Yes, Dr. Martin, for the prescaler, so whatever you set the prescaler bit to be, it's going to count up to that number. And then once it counts up to that number, then it adds a tick to the timer. Yes. Okay. That's right. And it's, it, and it's only powers of two. So if you go back and look at, uh, let's see if we go back and look at that uh, in here. So I'll share that screen again. Yeah, you can see you get you get a you get two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, or two fifty-six. Those are your choices. So you can't make it. You can't you you can't make it forty-six, for instance, or anything else. Those, only these powers of two are your choices. But that's exactly right. And you can also just turn it off and have it one to one. Every every tick is a tick is a count in the in the and the counts are kept in this TMR zero register, which we which we we also clear because the counter is counting all, once you turn the counter on, it's counting all the time. So it, when you go into your delay module, you want to reset the timer to zero. And uh, so you want to clear the flag and you want to reset the timer to zero. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions about, about what we covered so far? Yeah, I, yeah, I will. Uh, somebody, I see somebody. Yes, I will upload. I'll upload this lecture. It takes a little bit to convert, and then I put it on YouTube. It takes it a few minutes, you know, a little while to get it all done. But uh, I will put this lecture up, and I'll also put the one from Tuesday up. Okay, any other any other questions? Did everybody follow that pretty well? So hopefully this will make sense, and uh, and you'll see that uh, your your blink rate will be a little little faster. Okay, I'm gonna now. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the assembly language things I want you to be able to do. So let's do that, and um, I'm gonna do this again. And let's see, I wanna, wanna make sure. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we, so I wanna make sure we cover, uh, uh, doesn't, so we've, we've, so I want you to make sure you understand these key instructions. There's no, they can all be uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter. I, for some reason I wrote this with, like this and these like this, doesn't matter. So I want you to remember, uh, 
we have our byte oriented instructions and most of them take two operands, but this MOV WF only takes one operand and then our little instructions only take one operand. Okay, and uh, so then if we, if we go back and we, we look at uh, our uh, instruction set, which we'll go down here to 29. So, so now I wanna talk a little bit about, we, we talked about it already, but I wanna talk about this bit test F skip clear, bit test F skip set. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll talk about it in the context of, of our push button. All right, so let me bring in this. So when we, when we use, um, Okay, so so we're going to use we're going to use RB seven as our push button, and so remember we have we have three ports. We have port A that has six pins: zero, one, two, three, four, and five. We have port B that has four pins: four, five six and seven, and we port FC that has all eight pins, zero through seven. And port A, zero and one are taken up with our uh, programmer debugger header, and so is the master clear pin three. So we really only have three pins that we can use in port A without, uh, without limiting our, our debug capabilities. We could use other, those other pins and they're, they're plenty of ways of doing it. We could still program the device and then we could put a jumper back, uh, take off a jumper, put a jumper on and, uh, and reuse them for some other function. That, that's totally legal. Uh, but we're, we don't have to do that because we're not that tight on pins. Okay. <clears throat> and then we have four pins in port B and pin seven is connected to the push button on, uh, it, with that jumper. So it, it could be jumpered to the push button or it can be jumpered to the master clear. Those are the choices with that jumper. Now, if you want it for the master clear, whenever you push it, you reset the chip. And, and strangely enough, sometimes if you leave it in the master clear position, you may think it's working because it actually is resetting the chip. Yeah, so it will stop the blinking light and whatnot. As long as you hold it, the chip's in reset. But, uh, but we want to do the actual push button function, RB7. And remember, the way this works, we have, we have, here's your microprocessor, and this is RB7 input. And then we have out here uh, a resistor that pulls this up the VDD. And actually this is, uh, I think this is 100K. It's a pretty big 100K ohms. And then here's our button. And then this is to ground. So when the button is pushed and this is closed, we're grounding RB7. When this is open, we're pulling RB7 up to VDD with this fairly high value resistor. So, so pushed, it's a logic zero. Not pushed, it's a logic one. So, so you have to remember this in order to get this right. Now, we can, what, what we do is, first we have to configure it for an input, which means we have to have tris b7 equal to one. Now it is by default. And then we also have to clear, for it to be digital, we have to, we have to, we have to clear the Ansel bit. Now it turns out that RB7 does not have an analog function. So therefore it does not have an ANCEL bit. Uh, it's an ANCEL B, ANCEL B. So there's actually not an ANCEL, uh, ANCEL the ANCEL B register doesn't have a bit, doesn't, doesn't, isn't implemented in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the bit four position. And of course, since there's only four, since zero, one, two, three aren't implemented either, 
So there's nothing in zero, one, two, and three. Five, I believe, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I think, I, th I forget which ones are implemented, but to find out, it's easy to do. We just go to the data sheet and we go down to our ports, IO ports, and we go down to the B and actually we just have to go to Ansel B register and we'll figure it out. And we'll look at all these registers eventually here. So here's port B uh, coming up, I think. Port A, port A, port A, port A, flat A, and weak clumps, okay. And that's register. Okay, now we have port B. Uh, and on the port B, we have, so here's our port B register. There's just only implemented pins seven, six, five, and four. The bottom three, four bits are not implemented. And uh, our TRIS register has only the upper four bits. And our latch register, the, only, the upper four bits. And then our ANSEL register only has bits four and five. There is no analog function for bits six or for RB6 or for RB7. So we don't actually have to worry about that, but it's still good programming practice to do it anyway, because if you forget, it doesn't hurt to do it. And if you forget and don't do it, it, it will mean your digital input will not work. So it's just a good practice to, to always do it. And then you'll... Now, in addition to the register we just looked at, the port register, the TRIS register, the latch register, and the ANSEL register, every, every port also has a weak pull-up register and an input level register, control register. So, so, so those other two registers are also available. The input level just changes it from a TTL level to a Schmidt trigger. And we'll talk about that eventually. It's just, it changes exactly where it switches over from a zero to a one. And, uh, and then the weak pull-up registers, uh, you have to also turn on all the weak pull-ups by setting that bit in the in the option register, which we are clearing that bit, and we set it, so we're going to turn all these off. But they but if you look by default, they're all turned on. They're all set to one on reset, and you can see, uh, yeah, one pull up is enabled, zero pull ups disabled. So typically by default, the pull ups are turned on, and the reason for that is it, it, they're by default all inputs. And by default, they all have these weak pull-ups, which means that uh, that that you don't have any floating inputs, which is sort of important. So I suppose we probably we probably should actually uh, leave all these things on in the option register. But anyway, uh, but for the most part, uh, yeah. So uh, so generally, generally these weak pull-ups are turned on to avoid having floating inputs. Uh, Although you can have floating inputs, it's not the end of the world, but it's, it's just good programming practice to not do that. Okay, so let me, let me talk about, so, so let's, let's look at, so how do we, how do we pull that? So let's, let's look at that. So let's say, let's say we have, uh, let's say we have our blink routine, okay? So if we take our blink routine, let's say we're blinking, we're gonna blink the, the, the green, LED. Okay, so the green LED is on RA5, pin five of the A port. So, so the way we're going to blink it is we're going to bank cell port, uh, we're going to bank cell LAT latch A, and then we're going to, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll clear it. So bit uh, clear F A latch A comma five. And then we'll delay, we'll call delay. And then we'll bank cell lat A again. And we'll bit set F. And then we'll uh, go to, we'll call, well, we'll call, we'll call 
delay again. And then when we come back from delay, we will go to loop. And this will have this labeled up here with loop. All right, so this is our standard uh, loop for blinking the LED. Now, what if we wanted to use the push button and avoid blinking it? Uh, so how do we do that? Well, you could do that. A, you could do that a couple different ways. So, so remember that again, our 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 push button is on RB seven. So what we have to do, and remember that it's that it's pushed. It's going to read zero. So so let's say we just put right here at the at the top of the loop. So we move this up the loop up here and instead we would we could we could say bank cell uh, bank cell now because we're because we're because we're reading because we're reading an input we have to make sure we configure rb7 tris register for an input which it is by default we also have to make sure we clear the ANSELT bit, which it is by default. So we can kind of skip those steps, but but it's perilous to be cavalier about those steps because if you forget to do them when you have a pin that actually you want to use as an input that that uh, that does have an ANSELT bit, you you have to clear it or it will not work as a, as a digital input. And then if someplace else in the code somebody had set that RB7 as an output. And then now we want to use it as an input. We better make sure we do, in fact, set it as an input, even though by default at, at power up it is an input. But we just you just don't want to be cavalier about that. Okay, so so uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second how to configure that. But for right now, let's say it's configured properly. So so we're going to bank cell. Now, are we going to use are we going to use the latch latch B? Or are we going to use port B register? Somebody tell me which which you think we use if we want to read our our RB seven as an input. That's right. Why can't we use the latch? It doesn't it have doesn't that not, this was like the lower four bit the higher four bit bit. Okay, so let's if we go back to the data sheet and we look at our ports right here. What uh, let's see uh, let's look at the register actually. This little diagram tells you everything you need to know about this. Notice when we write the latch, the lat A or lat B or lat C, we're actually writing the flip-flop. And we're reading the latch right here. We're gating the output of the flip-flop to the data bus. So we're reading the flip-flop. So the latch writes and reads the flip-flop. When we write the port, it writes the flip-flop too, but when we read the port, it gates the input pin onto the data bus, assuming that the ANSEL bit is set correctly. So we have to be very careful not, not to, uh, when we want to read, we have to read the port, but when we write, we should write the latch. And you always take a little bit of a risk when you write the port because the chip uses read, modify, write. And when you write the port, it reads the port, modifies it, and writes it. And if the pin, uh, if the pin is shorted, uh, you, if, some, if some of the other pins in the port are shorted, it can actually change them when the only thing you wanted to do is to write this, the flip-flop for a different pin, say, for, well, for this pin. But you're going to read all all the all the pins in the port you're going to read and you're going to write them you're going to modify the one you want and then write them all back out well if you read something that's not on the data register you'll actually modify that bit that has nothing to do with the bit you were interested in and so you can get some strange behavior so you always write the latch but read but if you want to read you have to read the port unless of course you want to see what you wrote in the latch but since you wrote the latch you should know so you almost never want to read the latch and you almost never want to write the port. Uh, and that's just good practice. However, a lot of times you can get by with it. <laughs> it's just that every now and then, it, in a rare case, it's pretty rare, 
but I have definitely, I have pulled my hair out trying to debug programs uh, where my read, modify, write uh, to the port was giving me trouble and I did not realize it. Uh, and it comes up in the strangest places. I'll see if I can find an example of that code. I, I wanted to save one, but then I didn't and forgot. All right. And, and, this is, and this shows you, this code illustrates initializing port A register. The other ports are initialized in the same manner. And basically, you know, this is a good way to do it. Bank cell port A, clear it. Bank cell latch A, clear it. Bank cell ancel A, clear it. Bank cell tris A, and then put ones where you want to have inputs and zeros where you want to have outputs and store that in tris A. And here's how they, here's how they do that. Uh, I've never, I've not seen that notation, but anyway, I guess that's old notation. We normally just write B uh, and then the ones, the Z ones and zeros. You don't have to put the quotes in. Interesting. They probably wrote this in data sheets years ago and they've just never updated it. But I, I assume this would still work though. Interestingly, I didn't even see that. And notice, uh, five and three are inputs, and two and two through zero are outputs. Of course, we're not we're we're not using zero and one except for our debug header. So, uh, yeah, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so this is really the diagram you need to have burned in your brain to under to make sure you really understand how these ports work. And of course, the tris bit turns on or off this this uh, buffer. So it either connects or disconnects the flip-flop from the pin. Output, connected, input, disconnected. Okay, so back to our code. So, so what this lets us do then is if we put, if we put in, so what we're gonna do, one, assuming we have RB7 configured as an input, digital input, then we bank cell, uh, port B, and then we bit test F skip. Uh, in this case, we want to skip when it's uh, set uh, port B, comma, 7, because it's RB7. And then we want a branch instruction here. We can just do BRA loop. Now, if it's pushed, well, if it's not pushed, we're going to skip this branch instruction and just continue to blink the light, loop, blink the light, loop, blink the light. But as soon as you push the button, you're going to not skip this branch instruction, and you're going to go back to loop, and you're just going to go around in this tight little circle here where you're just testing your, your, your push button. As long as your finger's on it and it's reading zero, it's going gonna, it's gonna to not skip and it's going to take the branch and it's going to stay in a tight little loop here and never blink the light. And we can move this little set of instructions around where we skip this bit clear thing or we skip the bit set thing so we can leave the light on, we can leave the light off, or we could put it here and here. And depending on where you push it, you'll, leave, you'll, con you'll continue to see the light stay on or you'll continue to see the light stay off. So, I'm gonna. We'll leave. We'll let you play around with that in lab. But you can see, uh, just a, just these few instructions. So basically, all we're doing, we're just we're conf so we configure. We configure RB7 as a digital input, and we do that with the tris and the ansel tris B and A N S E E L B pin seven. And you can use the bit bit set. Bit, you can use the bit uh, set for here and the bit clear for here if you want. Comma seven. You have to bank sell them, of course, first. And then once you get that set up, then then you can you can uh, you can always test the push button with bit set uh, 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 bit test f skip clear or bit test f skip set and you you in here you skip skip not pushed and here you skip 
push. Which means typically when you skip, you're usually gonna not branch, although that depends on how you set that up too. You could also use it just to skip over. Uh, well, the only thing is, you can, the problem is if you wanted to use it to skip over your, uh, your, bit to, your bit set or bit clear instruction, because you have to have a bank cell in there to get the port right, uh, you actually have to skip two instructions. So you can't use it in that mode uh, because remember you have to do bank cell bank cell, uh, say lat A, and, and then you would do bit clear F. Well, so that's two instructions you'd have to skip, and you can only skip one with these bit test F, skip clear bit test F. So what you have to do is you have to put your branch right after the bit test and then skip past the branch and not take the branch then uh, as the default condition, but but very powerful instructions, and uh, and you can do lots of different things with them. And I want you to play with those in lab on Friday, so you kind of get used to how they look. Okay, I'm going to stop with that. Uh, uh, next week in class, I'm going to talk about some other functions. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about how to. Uh, so we've done the for loop. I'll review that. How we can uh, use a push button how we can configure a register, uh, a register like for uh, timer zero, TMR zero, or for like OSCON, and some, some of the others uh, for a port or a port pin. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, uh, we'll also do um, how to exchange X and Y values. So we'll talk about that on a Tuesday. Let me stop there and see if anybody's got questions. Yeah, I had a question. Okay, Ben. Um, so at the, I basically my question is what's the difference between the branch instruction and the go-to instruction? So, so we went over that uh, in some detail on Tuesday, just to review. Uh, so let me, I'll share my screen real quick and we'll look at the data sheet. Um, so if we look at the data sheet and we go down here to the instruction set, chapter 29, and we scroll, uh, we scroll down to the uh, branch. So here's the BRA instruction. Notice that there's a relative branch offset and it's K. And notice K is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bits. And the other bits, the other five bits are opcode to tell it what the instruction is. Okay, so these nine bits, uh, give you into two's complement. So you actually get plus eight bits one way and plus eight bits the other, or minus eight bits the other way. So you can jump forwards and backwards eight bits are 256 instructions roughly. It's, it's actually, uh, you get 256 minus and 255 ahead. Okay, okay. If you do the go to right here, it also has a constant K, but notice Compared to here, its constant K is two more bits. So you get not nine bits, but 11 bits. So you go plus or minus 10 bits because it's a two's complement. Okay. And that means you can go 1,024 uh, backwards and 1,023 ahead. But since our program memory is at 4K or 8K, I guess it's 8K. You can't jump from the very beginning of program memory to the very end of program memory with this instruction. So you have to have some have, kind of keep your wits about you now and see, you don't worry about it, it takes care of it for you. But in assembly language, uh, you can't get there. <laughs> I don't even know if the assembler will give you an error. It might not. It probably it should, but it might not. So uh, I've never tried that. So you might actually have to have a landing pad somewhere, you know, let's say you had to jump 4K. Yeah, like make it you, in two steps or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'd have to do it in, well, for 4K, you'd have to three steps. Okay. Exactly. So then why would you ever use branch if you can reach more instructions using the go-to? No reason. Okay. Yeah, so like, I, I, I also said that on Tuesday that I, okay. I don't know why they put this. 
yeah, it's stupid to have included it because it's completely eclipsed by the go to. Uh, okay. So I don't know, but BRA is shorter. So I usually write BRA, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to keep in mind it, it, you know, for the programs we write, we normally don't have a thousand lines of code. But if you do, now you've got to think about the fact that, uh, you know, well, if you have more than, if you, if you, ha if you have more than, uh, you know, 256 lines of code, you have to think about this one. Okay. 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 That makes sense. Sorry. Sorry for making you, you repeat yourself, but no, no, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I'm sure there are people that were there Tuesday that have already forgotten this. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it does come pretty quick, but I think once they start writing the code, then it'll make a lot more sense. Yeah, and and here's the deal. I, I'm never gonna make you take a test, nor are you gonna have to do anything in lab where you don't have all this information available to you. So it, you don't have to memorize this stuff. You just have to know where it is. Mm -hmm. And you have to have some idea of what's available as a tool that you can use. And once you kind of get that, then you then you can take off and, you know, and then and and basically, uh, you know, code to your heart's content. And it's fun to use all these things. I mean, you know, like the one that gets misused is this swap f, uh, and this is swap nibbles. It's the swap the lower four bits with the upper four bits. It's not the swap uh, x location with y location. So when we do the when we exchange x and y, we can't use this. But we. It's, I use it extensively when I wrote the, the driver for the, uh, for the LCD because the LCD only uses four bits to control the, the LCD, the, the liquid crystal display. And uh, you have, so you have to move nibbles all around all the time with that. And this is great for that. But uh, it's not particularly useful for anything else. Okay, cool. So you're basically like teaching us how to teach ourselves? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to teach you how to fish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I forget what that was the other day. Uh, something really stupid about teaching people to fish as opposed to giving them a fish. All right. Okay, so with that, uh, any other questions? Everybody good? I will post both the videos. Uh, I have a question pertaining to DSD. Yeah, go ahead, Josh um will there be class tomorrow morning or yeah good question yeah i uh, so you know what um maybe i'll send out an email today and i we're a little bit behind so i i guess i'll do a class i'll do a class at nine yeah okay thank you i'll, I'll do one i'll send out an email uh, at, uh, right now and tell everybody to we'll do class tomorrow yeah because we, we kind of we're just a hair behind i want to want to finish up the chapter two and get going on the review of logic design. Okay, we'll see, uh, we'll see you guys in, oh, one other uh, thing, I do want everybody to show up. I'm gonna send out an email, but I'll probably give you, I'd like the whole class to be there on Tuesday if possible. Um, and I'll, I'll send out an email. I'll give you one free course point for showing up on Tuesday in person. All right. Morton. Yeah. Um, can you go over homework two real quick? Oh, okay. Yeah, I said I would. So let's do that. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see what I have here. No, here. Okay. Yeah. So I want content. List. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so so download the data sheet, read chapter one, download from Blackboard Lab One files, uh, and assembly. Uh, find the document for the assembly of eBird. So I so yeah. So if you look at the schematic page, or you can even just look at your board. What I want you to do is is uh, you list all the pins and describe what each pin is used for, and. Uh, and so I know some of you have done that. I just want you to get familiar with the hardware. That's the point of this. So, uh, 
So VDD, of course, is power. RA5 is the green. RA4 is the U. So remember, there's a there's a sheet in the lab that uh, I think I said it here that uh, um, yeah. Let's, let's see. Let's go back to the lab. I'll show you where that is uh, right here. You're not sharing screen. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if you go down to um, the lab folder, so you need you need this sheet here. Um, Viva board pinouts. So this will help you. So then we have then we have this board or this this file. Which tells you what essentially what all the pins are, and then, then, um, and then we have this one, which wants you to fill out this little chart. So you basically have to read that document. You can also look at your board, uh, and uh, and you should be able to see, uh, be able should should be able to write down what all the pins are for. Um, so RA three, well that's the master clear, and it's it's connected to the to the programming header. It's the first pin in the programming header. So if we look at if we look at that, uh, the first pin in the programming header is is the RA is the RA uh, is the RA three the master clear pin. The next one's power ground RA zero RA one. So so RA zero one and RA three are the pins that we use for the programming header. This pin's not connected to anything. And so let's see. Uh, and just go through here and, and do all these things using those two documents. I guess we can shrink those down. So you can see the LEDs, RA5, RA2. So RA, uh, let's see, uh, didn't have RA, oh, RA2. That's the, uh, the blue LED, RC6. The red LED, um, then RB4 and RB6 are your, inter, your I2C interface. They both have two pull-up resistors on them. And then you have uh, your, uh, these are the PWM outputs you can use, RC5, RC2, RA2, and RC6. Notice that all, so three of these are this are, can be the same as your three LEDs. That's why you can control your three LEDs. Um, and then uh, let's see, uh, that's the end of it. And then if we look at, uh, uh, of course, RA0 and RA1 are the programmer header, as well as RA3, the pick it, well, uh, the snap head. The push button is our RB7, it's connected to the push button. Well, it's connected to the three pin jumper and you can jump it to the push button. Uh, and then uh, our four touch pads that spell out UTSA, RA4, RC6, RC1, and RC0, RC7, and R. So RA4 here, and then RC7, and then uh, RC2, and uh, RC1 and 0. And then uh, your analog header has three analog pins on it. The analog header is, uh, is, is this header right here. And if you look, you can see, if we look and and look at those pins. You can see they're labeled. RC2 is AN6, RC3 is AN7, and RB5 is AN11. Now, the reason those AN numbers come into play has, has to do with the, the data sheet. And if we go back up here to the, to the uh, where we list all the pins, uh, I think it's here, if you go up. Oh. Table of contents. Oh, there. This is the one. I always forget which one it is here. So, if here's our A to D inputs, A and zero, A and one, A and two. So A and zero is RA zero, A and one is RA one. Of course, we're using those for our debug header. So A and two is RA two, A and three is RA four, A and ten is RB four, A and eleven is RB five, A and four is RC zero, A and five is RC one, A and six is RC two, A and seven is RC three. AN8 is RC6 and AN9 is RC7. So when you look at the at that on the on the board, you're basically seeing you're basically seeing those uh, those AN numbers 
correspond to RC2, RC3, and RB5. So when we plug in our analog module here, and we uh, and we plug this sucker in, and we we actually have our temperature sensor, our photo our photo sensor, and our pot. One of them will be on RC3, one will be on RC2, and one will be on RB5. Uh, according to it. so temp will be on RB RC2, the light on RC3, and the pot on RB5 and so forth so um yeah let's see in that so basically you just keep filling all these in um and so that's the analog header and then these last two rc4 and 5 4 and 5 are connected to the 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 uh, the cr2102 header which is right here and those are MCU TX and MCU RX for the uh, UR. And then we also have 3.3 volts and 5 volts, uh, which actually go to our switch. And in the down position, you can jump or select which one of those you want to, to, run, the, to run the chip. And then DTR is not connected. And of course, ground is to ground. But we don't connect DTR. And then uh, we could, you could, we could work that out if we wanted to, but we don't. And then Finally, um, I think that's it. Yeah, so that should be all the pins. And then you can look and see if any of them. Uh, so, so kind of, um, yeah, connected to. So, so fill this out as best you can. And then download the data sheet on the linear voltage regulator. So you can, you can Google up uh, AM117 and 3.3 volts. There, there is one in, uh, there's on bulletin board in lab zero, it's there, but you can also just do it on, and you can also do the same for 5.0 uh, uh, regulator, similar part number. And basically uh, just go through this. And uh, so you can find parts uh, for a number of fixed output voltages. There's like one for 12 and one for nine, I think. But for arbitrary voltage, the then there are some of these that, have the ability to be adjustable, and you can uh, you can set up you can set up a pot and actually uh, adjust them uh, to provide a range of voltages if you want, or you can use a fixed resistor uh, voltage divider and basically pick the output you want. And uh, so, looking at the data sheet, how is this part described in the data sheet? At the top, as far as what kind of a, what type of regulator is it, and what's the normal current capacity? List the maximum current you can draw. There's usually a min, typical, max values listed. Use the typical and the minimum input voltage for the 3.3 volt device. So, what what's the minimum input voltage you can put in to get 3.3 volts out? Calculate the power used by the regulator if using a nine volt battery and the microprocessor drawing 50 milliamps. Uh, so, uh, so this is just so the idea of this. Uh, if we and it's a little more complicated than that, but uh, if we assume that, if we assume that all the power, so here, so here's your, here's your power, here's your ground, and this goes into your linear regulator, and then this goes into your micro processor, and then it's grounded here, and this is grounded too. All right, so. Some power does actually go through ground here, and actually, sadly, it's 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 probably something in the order of about twenty milliamps. I'll do a, uh, uh, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a demonstration where I'll show you exactly what those numbers are. We'll look at it with the, we'll look at it with the with the meter, and we'll see the current flow. We'll see the current flow in here. We'll see the current flow here. We'll see the current flow that's lost the ground in the regulator. So even if you're not driving your processor. The regulator still uses some power. That's why if you leave your battery plugged in, it'll drain your battery because you not only have the five volt, you've also got the three volts. You got two of these hanging on it, and and they're both draining about twenty milliamps to ground. If you put the microprocessor to sleep, now it's drawing it's drawing microamps when it's asleep, but its nominal working power is probably something like ten to twenty milliamps, something like that. So let's so forgetting this current lost here. So ignore that. Uh, 
but just assume that you have 20 milliamps, uh, 20 milliamps running in the microprocessor, and, and you're running the microprocessor, say, at 5 volts, okay? So now you know you have, you have 9 volts coming in, you have 5 volts dropped across the microprocessor, so you know you have 4 volts dropped across the regulator. So, so you can figure out how much is going down here because you know 20 milliamps goes this way, or, or well, you know, so you know, you know, 20 milliamps at a minimum, 20 milliamps has to run in here through and drop over four volts. So you can calculate that power, right? And you know, here 20 milliamps it is dropped over five volts. So, so you know that, so you can multiply your, 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 your current times your, times your voltage, and you can calculate the power here. And you can calculate the power there, forgetting the fact that there's some wasted power uh, that that's going straight to ground from the regulator. So ignore that. Uh, so so basically, you know, in this case, uh, if you're running this at 3.3 volts, now you're now you're dropping here. Uh, so 0.74. So now you're dropping uh, uh, 5.7 volts across the regulator. So you're obviously wasting more power in the regulator than you are than you are using in the microprocessor. And that's because that's how linear regulators roll. They they are very wasteful. Now for our purposes, they're cheap and they're they're easily available uh, and so that's why we're using them. You can put a more expensive regu switching regulator on and it won't use nearly that much power. So and that's it. All right. All right, any questions about that? Um, hello, Professor, yeah. can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, so next week you said we get a, a semester point for showing up in person, but does that mean we still have uh, the link to join online if we're able to? Because I don't have a parking pass yet. So there, there won't be any link, uh, but but all if you want to if you want to look on Blackboard, um, and you go down to the video file, I mean I, I encourage you to come to class. You know I, I I don't know what do you have to what do students have to pay for their student parking pass? Do you, uh, I don't know. I've never done the process for it because I've never had to go in person before, so I still have to find out about that. Oh, can somebody tell him? Oh, one hundred and seventy is that what it is? There should still be some guest parking somewhere around there. Yeah. I, I mean, for just one class, you can park in the garage. You don't have to have any kind of pass for that. Um, and and they'll, they charge you, but it's not for if you're just there an hour, it's not too bad. Um, you know, maybe two or three bucks or something. But um, I, I know for my 24 hour pass, I think I pay uh, almost $900 for that. It's expensive. But I know students is not, you know, like, yeah, you know, somebody said 170. So, oh, okay, that works. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, you might as well get that done because, uh, you know, then you'll have it for lab too. I know parking's a bit of a. But if you park in the uh, in the in the lot and take the bus, do they charge you to park over in the the lot over by the Valero? Is, I guess they do. I don't know. But I think you can. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you can. I don't know. I don't know the best way for students to park. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had to deal with that, but I know it's a bit can be definitely a bit of a hassle. All right. OK, with that, we'll let you go. Um, we will see everybody hopefully in person on Tuesday. And I'll, I'll send out an email. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.